a double page advert for the Bowie album Scary Monsters in 1980. Just as Punk was imploding, the ad showed him dressed as a clown with the tagline, often copied, never equaled. And those four words may perfectly sum up the life and work of David Bowie. He's actually a very difficult artist to describe. He was a singer who loved mime, an actor who said he didn't enjoy the stage, a 70s star who embraced every new piece of technology. But with Bowie, the music is central. He wrote the most brilliant songs. He sang about love, God and spaceships. He may well have been the greatest solo musician British pop has ever produced. Perhaps you only need two words to sum him up. Rock star. Here's one fan, DJ Lauren Laverne. David Bowie released his 20th album, Black Star, on Friday, coinciding with his 69th birthday. But when it comes to pop music, Bowie was a big bang in his own right. His creative DNA is everywhere. We Could Be Heroes was the refrain of his 1977 single, but the truth is that Bowie was the hero, an icon to music fans of every stripe, whose influence seemed to encompass teenage pop lovers and the musical avant-garde with equal ease. He played his first gig as David Bowie here, at what was London's Marquee Club in 1965. Before that, he'd been known as Davy Jones, but changed his name to avoid confusion with the lead singer of the Monkees. It was the first rebirth in what would become a career characterised by relentless evolution. Ground control to Major Tom Take your protein pills Four years later, in 1969, he produced his breakthrough hit, Space Oddity, a top five single. The song's hero, Major Tom, something of a precursor to the iconic alter ego he would unleash a few years later. The rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars captured the imagination of pop-loving British teenagers, but it also broke boundaries, not just because of the music. I was never very confident of my voice in studio as a singer, so I thought rather than just sing them, which would probably bore cancel everywhere, I would, um, I'd like to kind of portray the songs. This 1972 Top of the Pops performance, featuring an androgynously dressed Bowie, his arms slung around guitarist Mick Ronson's shoulders, is cited by many as the moment the 70s exploded, bringing into Britain's living rooms a conversation the country itself wasn't yet ready to have about sexuality, gender and outsider culture. The reasons that I do what I do is because I, like, I just like starving people. Starving? Yeah. Something to do. <laughs> By the mid-70s, Bowie had reinvented himself once again. He travelled to Berlin in a bid to escape his drug problems. The trilogy of albums he produced between 1977 and 79 would go on to change the face of contemporary music, but at the time, they took many fans by surprise. His sound was darker and more daring than before, and once more brought the cutting edge into the mainstream. He collaborated with Brian Eno in Iggy Pop, was influenced by the futuristic sound of German bands like Kraftwerk and Neu, and was inspired by disciplines outside of music too, using William Burroughs' cut-up technique to create lyrics. Nineteen eighty brought the new wave, but rather than being swept away, Bowie was going along for the ride. Ashes to Ashes introduced the new romantic movement to a global audience with a groundbreaking video ready made for the MTV age. The following year, his collaboration with Queen, Under Pressure, would give him his third British number one. Bowie's dark side was under control, for now. His latest sound was slick, 
Saul influenced and a huge commercial success. Sheik's Nile Rodgers produced his next album, Let's Dance, a transatlantic success that surprised Bowie. His new sound was at home on huge stages. The success of his serious Moonlight Stadium tour was followed a couple of years later by an iconic performance at 1985's Live Aid. During the 90s, his relentless creativity continued. Bowie experimented with electronic, neoclassical and industrial sounds. He worked on soundtracks and continued to perform live, including an appearance at Glastonbury Festival in 2000. But four years later, after suffering a heart attack on stage, Bowie withdrew from the public eye. There were rumours of ill health and occasional collaborations, but other than that, silence. Then, in 2013, came the next day. A hit with critics and fans alike, it saw Bowie revisiting his musical past and his old alter egos. His lyrics had acquired a new poignancy, and there was a sense of a man taking stock making peace with his past. Look up here, I'm in heaven. Bowie's final release, Black Star, now seems like a parting gift. After the news of his death broke this morning, fans shared the lyrics to lead single Lazarus, a transcendent goodbye apparently written to be delivered posthumously. As longtime producer Tony Visconti wrote in his tribute this morning, his death was no different to his life a work of art. Well, extraordinary images in that video, Lauren. And, and why do you think we've seen such a reaction today? Well, I mean, a few reasons. Obviously, it's proportionate to his influence. You know, the huge reaction just mirrors the, the massive influence that David Bowie had. We went on air on Six Music this morning from 10 o'clock and for three hours we just received message after message, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of messages from listeners. I know it was similar for you over at Radio 2. And what was really interesting to me was that these are people who love all different kinds of music and that, that came up frequently. Bowie, whether you were into electronic music, dance music, classical music, avant-garde music, you were just a pop fan, there was an access point for you. He was also an artist that you know influenced generation after generation for many of my listeners today. Day. We had um, several people talking about the way that, that he's tied up with their family memories. And obviously that just makes it incredibly personal. It is a personal loss to music fans because David Bowie changed the way that we saw the world. And do you know what? Even if you're not a big music fan, he is one of those artists that, that has become part of British culture. There's a certain point where an artist is, is so kind of ingrained in who we are as a country. And obviously, you know, now we talk about soft power and what Britain actually is. He's part of our national identity so he's a huge loss to, to all of us and then the second thing is just shock I think I think nobody knew this was coming you know there's been this really moving poignant reflective mood on on the last two albums certainly but nobody expected this today thank you Lauren Lebron. we began by talking about the music that David Bowie was also all about the look whether it was his album covers or sessions with photographers the way he dressed on stage or just when he was out and about the image of David Bowie was always cutting edge he was an artist for the eye as well as the ear and he became a fashion icon as Rebecca Jones reports it was his sound that took him to the top of the charts but it was his look that helped make David Bowie a star <laughs> From the mod style of his teens, through the glam rock of Ziggy Stardust, to the tailoring of the thin white duke, David Bowie understood the importance of fashion as a means of self-expression. A 17-year-old David Jones has just founded the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Long-Haired Men. This was, after all, the man who, when interviewed by the BBC back in 1964, was already challenging conformity. For the last two years we've had uh, comments like, darling, and uh, can I carry a handbag thrown at us? I think it's just had to stop now. The photographer, Terry O'Neill, worked with him regularly. 
when I came to photographing him, he always provided the clothes. I, I mean, I always trusted him because he would always have his look planned and what he wanted to look like, and so I went along with it. I mean, I didn't always agree with it, but I always went along with it. How did you come to photograph Elizabeth Taylor and David Bowie? When I was in LA, Liz Taylor rang me up and said, oh, I'd love to meet David Bowie, can you bring him down to the house? So I brought him there and he unfortunately was four hours late and so she was on the verge of walking out and of course she never gave him the part in the picture but later on they became really, really good friends. It was impossible not to have a friendship with David Bowie once you met him. At times he, he, he reflected total masculinity, but other times he, he looked very feminine, you know, and very, you know, that was part of his appeal. You know, he's loved by men and women. I mean, everyone, I can't think of a person in my life I've met who doesn't like him, ever. A retrospective exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum in 2013 documented David Bowie's influence on fashion, design, and sexuality. With his flamboyant makeup, clothes, and hairstyles, he rejected conventional masculinity. David Bowie made it cool to be different. I wanted to turn people on to new things and new perspectives, he once said. I'm not content just writing songs. Rebecca Jones reporting. Because Bowie operated under so many guises, he is a very hard artist to pin down. He was Ziggy Stardust, then the Thin White Duke, and then the bleach blonde 80s pop star of Let's Dance. He had lighter pop years and serious Berlin years and everything in between. So for us, Sean Keaveney, who does the breakfast show on BBC Six Music, analyzes just one song from the album Aladdin Sane. He's chosen Gene Genie. This is a staggering piece of footage from 1973. This is a live Top of the Pops performance from Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars from David Bowie. And you can tell it's live because you can listen to Mick Ronson's guitar sound and it sounds like a van full of police dogs. It's unbelievably violent. It's like that kind of Stooges MC5 meets the Beatles. And that was the mixture that got David where he, where he got very, very quickly in 1972-73 with this kind of music. Before this, rock and roll was a kind of male provence, wasn't it, you know? Here, it's just ambiguous, it's up for grabs, and they, you know, you just don't know, they get off from each other. It's possible, isn't it? It's more than possible, it looks like it to me. I love that ambiguity and that excitement of, of this particular clip. And just take a look at the man. This is 1973. A colossal culture shock for everybody, this. The shock of the new, that's what we're seeing here. Um, it's just a wonderful thing to see. Shirtless, total confidence. Brilliant. It's kind of a play on Jean Genet, who was, of course, a kind of revolutionary French novelist and playwright who used to talk a very forthright manner about homosexuality, so there's that running through it. But I think Gene Genie is supposed to kind of to be Iggy Pop as well, this sort of louche degenerate. Whoever it's about, whatever it's about, it's just one of the greatest rock and roll performances of all time. <laughs> Sean 
Frank Evening there, analysing Gene Genie. Now, there has been a global reaction to the death. Bowie spent his last years and his last days in New York. And you can see now the scene outside his apartment in the Soho area of Manhattan. You can see the flowers there and well-wishers who've arrived. Radio stations are playing Bowie records. And the city very much Bowie's home now and for some years and where he spent his final days as well. And of course, USA, the place where he forged that what was called Plastic Soul when he did his album Young Americans in 1975, the scene in New York. Well, we're going to go to LA, the other side of the States now, and to a musician who worked on 18 of Bowie's albums, including Aladdin Sane and Diamond Dogs. Mike Garson joins us. Did you have a sense working with David Bowie of his creative power, Mike? I mean, it, it was the highlight in my life every time I toured with him and on every album I played because he actually was the best producer I've ever worked with because he didn't micromanage. He had a vision, he would gently say it, and the music just flowed out of my fingers onto the piano and into the recording studio. I mean, it was magical working with him on every single album we did. And every tour we did, which had to be 10 or 15, plus these 18 albums over the years. So I had a blessing to really um, get to create with him and co-create with him over his long stretch of time from 2000, well, 1972 to 2005. Well, we I finished know, our last tour. I know it was, a, it was a very long period you spent with him. Was there any particular album where he almost brought you into that creative process and you saw it happening? It happened on the outside album, which we did in the mid-90s, because he brought in Brian Eno, myself, and Carlos, and uh, uh, Reeves. He wanted to sit and improvise in Montreux, at the studio that Queen used to record in and he wanted us to improvise for like two weeks, four hours a day and then he cut that all up and made a beautiful album from that but uh, we were all co-composers of, of the music Sterling Campbell was playing drums and he was trying to make sure he never stayed in his comfort zone and he made a point to say that he had some slower times in the 80s and he felt he compromised and he wanted to get back to his roots so he called all his favorite musicians and i was flattered uh, to be one of them thank you very much mike garson in los angeles who played keyboards on many bowie albums now one of his biographers said bowie's influence had altered more lives than any comparable figure but his origins were modest in Brixton in South London and in his early years he sang with a very London twang in his voice he became such a huge global star that he's not perhaps immediately identified now with any postcode but he was a British star and Lucy Manning is in Brixton for us now Lucy well, they're coming uh, hundreds to remember the Brixton boy and what a better way to do it than to sing and to listen to Bowie songs. For those of us who have Bowie posters on our walls, who had the excitement of seeing him live in concert, who knew his songs as soon as they came on the radio from the first few bars, it's why his death is so significant. And if you were born in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, possibly even later, his appeal stretched across the generations for the man who created the thin white duke and uh, lad insane he has gone for the songs well just play them loud i spent the day reminiscing with some bowie fans When Ziggy played guitar, Vivian Geit was in the audience night after night after night. When I was 15, 16, um, and he started on the Ziggy guitar, I just thought, I just, I just thought, this is fantastic. Um, and I spent the, that, the rest of that year and the following year, I think I managed to get to about 20, 22 dates on the Ziggy tour. 
Um, I'd left school, got three jobs so that I could save up to go. Round Ziggy playing guitar. All my old con- my concert tickets with my precious autograph from David Berry there. I used to look up to her, everything that David Berry said, I used to always want to take on board. You know, everything he did. Um, even when he shaved his eyebrows off and I shaved my eyebrows off and they never ever grew back. Um, he just, I, th- I think he was an inspiration to me. I, 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 I've actually lived a bit of the lyrics actually. I've. Um, I uh, lived in Ibiza and grew up near the North of Broads. See the mice in the million hordes From Ibiza to the North of Broads Man of Thoughts and Worth was, was actually was very underrated. So I'd been crying since 7 o'clock this morning or something. Died in his day at the same time as uh, David Bowie. Growing up in dull, leafy suburban Sussex, he gave me some inspiration. There was a big, bad world to go and see out there. He inspired me to uh, be different, to be creative. His best teenage fan moment, speaking to him on a radio phone in. We all decided in the playground, but the question to us was how do we think about looking, uh, Bowie lookalikes? What do you think of Bowie lookalikes? What did he think of well, Bowie lookalikes? He was very erudite. Very, very charming, and said that he uh, is glad that he can inspire people to, to be different. As Bowie played Suffragette City at Hammersmith Odeon, fan Graham Brown caught what he threw into the crowd. This maraca landed at my feet in uh, July 1973 at Bowie's uh, retirement uh, retirement concert. Um, became a very, very important possession to me. So, a constant soundtrack to my life. I know it's a cliche, but it's, it's true. Voices of some fans for you. In 1976, Bowie moved to Berlin, then divided between East and West by the Berlin Wall. It was a city filled with Cold War tension, and as an artist, he evidently fed off that. He stayed for three years and brought out three albums that in places still sound hugely experimental. Among the tracks was Heroes, perhaps the standout song of the entire Bowie catalogue. The city influenced his songs years after he left, when he released the next day in 2013 the lead single where are we now was seen by many as a reminiscence of his days in berlin to get the train from Potsdam to France You never knew that that I could do that Just walk in the day Oh 
Christian Fraser is outside David Bowie's former Berlin home and joins me now. What what a city in terms of Bowie's backstory, Christian. Yes, very important uh, to David Bowie, this city, Jeremy. Just across the road, that is the building where he shared an apartment with Iggy Pop. And I think the feeling that he had for Berlin is very much reciprocated by the hundreds of people who've come here today to lay their flowers, their tributes and their messages. And in fact, in the bar 70s, which stands there now beneath the apartment, he shared with Iggy Pop, they're playing the entire back catalogue uh, of Bowie today, which is drifting out onto the streets. And there's a message among those flowers which says thank you David you changed our lives forever which is slightly ironic because I think David Bowie probably came here in 1976 to change himself um, gone at Ziggy Stardust he come here to find the man who he was it was a very different city to LA and all the glitz and the glamour he'd left behind much more dark and melancholy and in his words it was a city where you could get lost but also find yourself too and out of that trilogy the Berlin trilogy of course came heroes fans will know a song which was about two lovers that stole a kiss at the wall when he came back in 1987 to play at that Eichstag in front of 70,000 people it was almost a split concert with hundreds pressed up against the wall on the eastern side as well and that is why there was this tweet today from the foreign ministry saying goodbye David Bowie you are now among heroes thank you for helping bring down the wall Thank you, Christian Fraser in Berlin. And with me now is Lauren Laverne and the BBC's arts editor, Will Gompertz. And Will, we were having a gentle disagreement about Bowie earlier because he's, he's very hard to pin down and agree on, isn't he? Well, he, he is. He's, well, I suppose he's a, a classic postmodernist artist. He, he had this sort of superficial persona which he changed time and time and time again. So he couldn't nail him down. But there was a constant theme with him. He had something to say. He had something important to say. And I suppose like any great artist, he was able to reflect the world back to us and not only make sense of it for us but to guide us and i think in a way that's why we're all so deeply sad about his passing today because we've lost a crucial guide in our life to make some sense of this crazy world that we live in and yet and yet he touched people so personally that's been clear today so putting those two views together is quite difficult well, i think it? for me they fit together i mean you know when we went on air this morning that that was what i said was when somebody dies what's desperately sad about it is that you lose the, you lose the world because mm. you lose the way that they see the world mm. and actually the, there's a, a kind of um, a, a lovely symmetry b b between those thoughts isn't there you know we lose his perspective and and also there's something about that generation you know he's, he's this leading light of, of the generation who taught us what it is to be an adult now how to be a grown-up in the modern world which you know involves not growing up so we <laughs> we don't want him to go you know we're like no but David you need to tell us what to do you can't go that's that's one of the things that that's so terribly and so personally yeah, it's devastating sh shocking. He, he claims he's, he's not allowed to go he's, <laughs> he's this figure which is so present in our lives and even though he withdrew himself over the last decade after after the heart, heart issues he, he still felt very big in our lives and when he came back with the um, with the album the next day and then even Lazarus you know these are powerful pieces of art and I described him as, as the Picasso of pop and I think that's exactly what he was he was a true artist forget out about him being a, a pop singer he, he had a it's above that. So, it's a great artist, whether it's Pinto or it's Picasso, it doesn't really matter. He was a man who did something quite extraordinary for us as as, as humanity. He, he he showed us what it was like to be alive. And he was brave, wasn't he, to, to wear a woman's dress on an album mm -hmm. cover in the, the early 70s. Yeah, it's extraordinary. You know, you see that top of the pops moment, which now you know we, we watch with David Bowie with his arm round Mick Ronson's shoulders, and, and of course we kind of take that for granted, but that's that's part of the job of pop music is to have that conversation first to you know bring those issues into the into the mainstream before we're ready that conversation always takes place the cultural dialectic is always ahead Thank of you. where we are as a Thank society you both so much Lauren of and Will Gompertz for coming in we could talk for several more hours we probably will won't we we've covered just some of the key moments of David Bowie's life an impossible task to get to them all and the emotion and loss many people will be feeling today we're going to leave you now with some of the images from an extraordinary life.